Back in with uh, uh, today's lesson, this is what the third part of chapter 13, which is dealing with manifest destiny. And today in particular, we're going to go into more detail on what life was like on the Oregon Trail. So if you were an Oregon Trail pioneer, not necessarily heading to uh, Oregon for any particular reason, and there's multiple reasons, like the other day we talked about Marcus and Narcissa Whitman as missionaries trying to spread Christianity. Uh, or later, we'll talk about uh, the gold rush bringing hundreds of thousands of people to California and seeks of instant riches. Uh, so lots of reasons for heading west, and the Oregon Trail was like the interstate highway to get there. So we'll take a look at what it was like and, and maybe some of the um, so some connections with us, with Nebraska, with our geography and our culture, and some things that maybe you've even seen if you've driven across the state of Nebraska. You've seen some of the things that I'm going to show you today, um, and, and part of just our history with the Oregon Trail. So uh, we, we just finished checking a worksheet, so if you're watching this video from um, your bedroom or from your living room and you have the coronavirus, uh, you have a Chapter 12 worksheet that somehow you need to get and get back to me. It's a pretty simple worksheet, 10 questions, get it done. And uh, by the next time we have class together, so if you're in my Wednesday class, we'll have class Friday. If you're in my Thursday class, we'll meet on Monday. Uh, you need to have at least 10 things done on your study guide. So while we're going through stuff today, you might even open up your study guide and work on that. Just to kind of keep up with things, you might be able to get 10 things done before class is over today. So here's our plan, rubber band. We're going with this. So if I go to where I think we are, we left off here. Click that, and I'll get my little remote control. Uh, so we 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 left off the last things we talked about. We were we were taking a look at uh, uh, the Mormon Church or the LDS Church and its movement across the country to escape religious persecution. Uh, we talked about Joseph Smith uh, founding the church because all the other churches were kind of a mess, and and, and how he created uh, from six followers to a whole bunch of followers in a very short amount of time. But they were persecuted, even though the First Amendment to the Constitution says they shouldn't be. Before we talked about the, the development of the LDS Church, or the Mormon Church and the Mormon Trail, we also talked about the Santa Fe Trail, which was a lucrative trading trail. And, and we also briefly touched on the Oregon Trail and Marcus and Narcissa Whitman. So uh, that brings us, oops, wrong way, that brings us here. Talking about our manifest destiny. Now, when we first started this chapter, we described the word destiny. <coughs> Excuse me. Somebody remind me what the word destiny means. It is your certain fate. So our manifest destiny is our fate to settle from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. We want it all. You could call it greed. You could call it a little bit of American arrogance, but that's sort of actually probably what sets the tone for what we think of as an American identity. America has always been that country that sees itself as a superpower, even before we were a superpower. We've always had this, uh, this opportunistic ideology that, that there's something better and we're going to go get it, or we're going to be the first, or we're the winners, or we're going to take it. Uh, so the idea of manifest destiny might have been the beginning of that. It's our God-given right. It's not just a goal. It's God telling us that we should control everything from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And when God tells us to do something directly, we better do it. If God said, do your homework, or you're going to get a lightning bolt in the forehead, probably better do your homework, even if you don't really want to. So, <clears throat> but... That also means that uh, there must be a certain amount of demand for religion at that time. Remember, we've talked about how <clears throat> religion kind of comes in waves. At times it's important to us, and at times it's not important to us. So if we're using God as our justification, as our reasoning for our destiny to settle from the Atlantic to the Pacific, it must have been a time when God is important in our culture. So ups and downs. When things are really, really bad and we don't have answers for our problems, we typically turn to religion to answer our questions. When things are really, really good, unfortunately, a lot of times people turn their back from religion because they don't think they need any help. 
So that's when we see the ups and downs. But uh, it, it creates this interesting time in America where we start kind of blowing out all of these ideas that the West is perfect. We know it's a, an ideological place where there's buffalo roaming and freedom and free land and, and, and beautiful land that's never been touched. And forget about the idea that it's already owned by Native Americans. Forget about the idea that the damage we're going to do when we head west into places like the, the plains and we kill off uh, six million buffalo, forget all that and just think about it's ours, we want it all. That's what manifest destiny is. It's, it's just a certain fate. You know, is it a destiny that, that Kylie and Victor will someday be married? Harry's never in school. Come on. Victor it's was, Kylie and Victor. Victor was in school last week. I have this, I have the, oh, that's true. But I have this uncanny ability to imagine people together. And so probably like in a couple of years, prom's going to roll around. Victor's going to be standing outside Kylie's house with one of those goofy signs. A promposal, I think they call it. And they're going to be like, and when I said it, Victor kind of looked at me like, why are you telling everyone? And Kylie smiles and says, no. And that smile is sort of a giveaway. So see, I can tell there's a little spark there. They don't even know it yet. But the things that Mr. Bellamy knows that people don't even know, it's just like, woo-woo. Above it. Eighth grade dance coming up in a couple of months, right? Yeah. If you ask Ari, you might cause Kylie and Ari to fight. No, I <laughs> Gosh, I don't even know what we would do. And Kylie and Ari, they like, I come into class one morning, first block, and all the desks are moved out of the center, and Kylie and Ari are like circling each other, getting ready to throw down. There's hair getting pulled and biting, scratching, clawing. It could get really ugly really fast. <clears throat> And Victor's like, no, ladies, don't fight. There's enough of me for both of you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This is what happens when you skip my class. When you stay home sick, I have to have reason to pick on you. Like, I quit picking on Skeletor because he's made it to class like two times in a row. I go to class every day. That's why I quit picking on you because you're here. So, anyway. <clears throat> I like this map because this is like a bunch of the trails. So we can see the Santa Fe Trail here that, that got William Begnell to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and he made a ton of money. But most of the trails are starting from St. Joseph or Independence, Missouri, because that's the furthest west that rail lines would, would stretch. So you could get supplies in Independence, Missouri, but you couldn't get supplies anywhere else. So we're going to go up the Oregon Trail. So we're going to follow this line from Independence to St. Joseph, all the way up into Nebraska Territory and follow the south side of the Platte River all the way up here. And then once you get here to what is it, Fort Hall, you have to decide if you're going to go south into California. Why would you head south into California? What was the draw to California? Gold or, yes, nice beaches, of course. Yes, gold, the gold rush in 1849. Uh, or are you going to head north into Oregon Territory, Oregon and Washington Territory, all that open territory, kind of where Marcus and Narcissa were. So these trails go all different places. Or you follow the Mormon Trail here, and, and you, you stand the opposite side, the north side of the Platte River, away from the Oregon Trail pioneers. And you get into Wyoming, and then you kind of head south to the Great Salt Lake, and the Mormon Trail would even take you into uh, Southern California, uh, maybe for some of the same reasons. Everyone's looking for opportunity. Even if you're escaping religious persecution, you want to find more and you want to find better. That's what life is about for us. Uh, if you have a, a great life, you probably don't necessarily need to change. But <clears throat> America dictates to us that if you're already rich, you want to get richer. If you're poor, you want to get less poor. All of us have sort of that, that desire. Even though I'm satisfied with what I have in my life, I might not be quite comfortable with what I have with my life. I might be worried that I might need more later, so I'm going to work even harder to try to 
to establish a higher lot in my life. All of your parents have a goal or a dream that you will be more successful than them. Even if you have very successful parents, they're hoping that maybe they've had to go through some struggles in life that they're going to try to help you avoid. And, and that might be a good thing or it might be a bad thing, but uh, that's what we do as parents. I think that's how probably all parents function. So when we look at the Oregon Trail, uh, one of our first exposures to the Oregon Trail uh, is this old school video game. Now, notice the screen. It's green on a black screen. We actually owned this computer. This was a, one of the first computers that was built for public consumption, meaning it was sold to regular, ordinary people. It was called the Apple IIe. And it was probably, I have no idea how expensive it was, but it was a Christmas present to my brothers and I one year. My, my mom and dad gave us this Apple IIe. I suppose they thought it would make us smarter. There was no internet, understand. All it had were these great big floppy disks. This is called a floppy disk. Maybe you've seen one. Maybe Mrs. Baker has one. And It's literally floppy. It's, a, it's thin, like a piece of cardboard thin, but it's made out of plastic. You could flex it or bend it. You didn't want to flex it or bend it too much because you could damage the disk that's inside. It's just a film of disk. And you'd stick that in your computer, and that held about one megabyte of memory one meg. So we don't even measure things in megs anymore because megs are so small. When we measure stuff for our computers, we measure them in gigabytes, which is a thousand megabytes. <clears throat> so for one gigabyte of memory, it would take a thousand of these. Now, this original Oregon Trail game fit on one floppy disk, which meant the original game was one meg. So the graphics on it were really, really simple. The instructions on it were really, really simple. It's sort of the purest, most simplest form of a video game. I think we had three video games. We had Oregon Trail, which was probably our favorite. We had uh, Sabotage, which interestingly enough, all it was was a gun, and it would shoot paratroopers out of the sky. You're not supposed to shoot paratroopers out of the sky, but that's what the game did. And I, can't, I think maybe the other one was like Space Invaders or something like that. But all of them were super simple because you could only hold one meg of memory. That computer was pretty much worthless to us, except we had three or four games. You could type on it, and you could print on it, and it seemed really cool, but <clears throat> so basic compared to what we're used to today. Uh, if we have time at the end of class, I want to come back and actually take a look at this, because I don't know if on your fill-in notes is this a link where it says Oregon Trail and it's underlined. I don't think it is. So it used to be a few years ago... Uh, I had the Oregon Trail game linked, but uh, Apple stopped using, and I think your Chromebooks too, stopped using what's called Flash. Yep. And the Oregon Trail game was a Flash game. But I found one that I think works, and I linked it on mine. So if we can come back, we might, as a group, see what it's like to play the Oregon Trail game. But it, just show of hands, how many of you have ever played it or a version of it? All right, you die most of the time, and there's usually two causes of death. One is dysentery. You, you, bloody diarrhea, explosive bloody diarrhea. Or you get bit by a rattlesnake. Those are probably the two most common causes of death. You have to cross rivers, and you have to hunt, and it's actually really kind of a fun game. And it's got a little bit of strategy involved and a little bit of uh, just computer luck. Yes, Skeletor. It does. You found one that's not flash? Yeah. So don't do it now, but if we have time, we'll come back to it. So, uh, But uh, this is a, a rundown, and you, you have access to playing this video, but this just gives you an idea of what the Oregon Trail game is about. You go in and put names of your friends in, and some of them are going to die. Not everyone in your party is going to make it in your wagon. By the way, when you cross the Oregon Trail, you have to, you have, to have money. The, the people that headed west weren't the poorest of the poor. Just like immigrants that came to America, your ancestors, when they came here, they probably were poor, but they weren't the poorest of the poor. It doesn't matter if they're from Mexico or if they're from Ireland or England or Germany. You know, we all have different uh, roots. Uh, my ancestors were English and Irish. Uh, my ancestors probably came to America, at least some of them, because there was a potato famine in Ireland. 
the potato crops failed. So they came here looking for opportunity. But my ancestors, when they got to America, had nothing. They were poor, but they weren't the poorest because they still had to be able to afford passage to get here. Just like these Oregon Trail pioneers, they've got to buy stuff. Now, the prices on here are more like uh, just thrown on there for the example of a game. But you've got, you, you need oxen and you need bullets and you need the wagon wheels and wagon parts. And, and you need to take some food because you're not going to be able to supply all of your food needs on the trail itself. So flour and sugar and, and staple foods, things that you need to survive. So you couldn't be broke. You had to have some money in order to cross the path. So... Just to give you an idea, and I think this is kind of fun as a comparison, a uh, hundred pounds of flour was two dollars in the 1840s. That's a big bag of flour. You probably, if you do any baking, you probably buy five pound bags of flour or maybe ten pound bags of flour today, and it gets you through with what you need. Uh, beans, dried beans were eight cents a pound. Coffee was seven cents a pound. Uh, a pound of coffee today is probably more like eight or nine bucks. That might even be cheap. I'm not really sure on some of this stuff because honestly, my wife does most of our grocery shopping. Uh, tea, 55 cents. That's kind of expensive. Dried apples, six cents a pound. Those are yummy. Sometimes I put apples on our dehydrator and sprinkle a little cinnamon on them and they're so good. <coughs> Sugar, nickel. Uh, what's the deal with lard? You mean know what lard is? It's animal fat. So what do you use lard for? That's for cooking. You use it to cook stuff. So whereas you might put some vegetable oil in a recipe, old timers use lard. You just have a big old bucket of animal fat, 100 pounds of it for $5. Dried beef? Uh, that sort of be like jerky. Six bucks for 100 pounds of jerky? Heck yeah, we'd all jump in on that. And bacon, $5 for 100 pounds of bacon. If you go to the store right now, uh, meat is really expensive. If you buy a pound of bacon, that's just one little package of bacon, it's probably five or eight dollars, maybe closer to eight. It used to be three or four a few years ago. So uh, comparing prices is always kind of fun. Household goods, you're going to need some stuff. Like when you get to where you're going, you're going to need a stove. You can buy a stove for 7 bucks, a butter churn for 2 a Dutch oven. Anybody know what a Dutch oven is? It's a, a big metal pot. You can cook anything in a Dutch oven. You can bake a loaf of bread. You can make stew. Uh, it's cast iron, so you can put it directly over a fire. You can bury it in coals. Uh, if you do a lot of camping, cooking with the Dutch oven is kind of fun. All you got to do is put charcoals underneath it and charcoals on the lid, and it'll cook the stuff inside just like you're cooking it in an oven. Uh, but a Dutch oven, $3. A washboard, $0.30. Cents. So you got to wash your clothes. That's the old school washing machine matches, an oil lamp, a trunk. I actually have a steamer trunk that uh, uh, is <laughs> sitting in the entryway to my house. Um, and you look at it and you're like, what's this old crummy looking trunk sitting in Mr. Bellamy's house for? Well, it was my great, great grandmother's when they were actually on the Oregon Trail headed west. So it's got some cool history. It would have at some point been bouncing around in the back of a Conestoga wagon full of all of their belongings. So what do I keep in it today? All of their belongings. So old stuff that was my great-great-grandmother's or my grandmother's, and, and it's kind of cool. But that trunk was probably $5 back then. It, mine's not in very good shape, so it's not worth much. But sometimes the antique versions of those, if they're in very good shape, people like to use them as decorations. They're pretty valuable. Boots were kind of expensive. Women's shoes, less expensive. This whole trail, by the way, you're going to walk. A Conestoga wagon, that's the big ones that you're used to seeing in the movies. Gigantic wagon, $250. So again, you couldn't be poor. This is all expensive stuff. An emigrant wagon, slightly smaller, about $150. An extra axle, wheels. Uh, if you want oxen to pull your wagon, they're $25 a piece. Uh, a horse, you might need a horse when you get where you're going. A prime horse means like a really good horse. 
100 bucks, a, 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 an okay horse is 50 bucks. Any of you horse people here? Horse people? You don't own one, but you love horses. Do you own a horse, Addy? How much is a, a good horse cost today? If you if you went horse shopping, thousand bucks gets you a, a good horse. Yeah. Um, my neighbor, <coughs> he sells horses, but he sells like fancy ones. I don't even know what they do, but they're like Italian something something, and they're like thirty thousand dollars for a horse. I can't tell what's special about it, but I, I'm not a horse person. When I used to work on the farm and we'd head out into the pasture, we had my boss had a horse and he had two four-wheelers. And he's like, uh, Bellamy, you want the horse or the four-wheeler? And it wasn't even a question. And he knew it wasn't a question. He was teasing me because he knew I wasn't a horse guy. I would feed the horse, but that's it. Uh, I'm like, I'm taking the four-wheeler, boss. A horse is handy because it could go places in the pasture where the four-wheeler couldn't get to. But I didn't care. I'm not riding on the horse because I'm going to fall off. I've told you some horse stories before. And my horse stories are horror stories to me. So um, it's not that I don't like them. I just, yeah, don't ride them. Uh, a cow, 25 bucks. That'd be pretty nice. A wagon canvas, $8. So a lot of stuff that doesn't really matter. An axe, 3 bucks. A pistol, seven fifty. Pistol's a handgun, right? Like a one that you can put in a holster. A shotgun, $10. So those of you that are gun people or hunters, you're like, wow, that'd be sweet. But remember, wages weren't very much. <clears throat> lead for bullets. You make your own bullets, 20 pounds of lead for $1.20. Bullet mold, powder. So to buy everything listed up there um, in, in the past four slides, except two oxen and two fair horses, would cost you between... $537 and $637. Remember, a lot of laborers, depending on your skill, made maybe between $5 and $8 a week. So in order to be able to head off on the Oregon Trail, you probably had to sell everything you had and save up for a while to be able to afford all of this stuff. Now, not all of it you're going to need to buy because you might already have a pistol and you might already have a shotgun. And you probably have a lot of that stuff, so you don't have to buy it, but um, maybe you would. So what would that cost uh, from then to now, just to give you an idea of how much money you would have to save up if it was today because of that increase? It would cost you between fifteen dollars and $18,000 just to have enough to set off on the trail. And that doesn't give you anything really left over when you get there to get your new life started. So you can sell all of your stuff. You can sell your car and you can sell your house and all that. And you might have enough cash to be able to take off. This is a picture of a Conestoga wagon. <clears throat> Big and heavy. This one's got a team of six horses that pull it. Some people preferred horses. Some people preferred oxen. It might only take two or four oxen to pull it because they're stronger, but they don't move as fast. Uh, and you didn't get a ride in this. So if your family takes off on the Oregon Trail... Everybody's walking. The only people riding might be grandma because she's too frail to walk 2,000 miles. Or, or, or little children might need a nap. But the rest of us, we've got jobs to do. If I'm the dad, uh, I'm leading the horses down the trail. You know, the, the, the horses in front and the wagons in front are kicking up dust and I'm sucking in dust and my eyes are burning and it'd be horrible. If you guys are the children, you're off off the trail, off the beaten path looking for like cow pies, because that's going to be the fuel for our campfire, because there, aren't a, there isn't a whole lot of wood along the Oregon Trail, especially after the first immigrants or emigrants, sorry, have been down the trail. So you guys are doing work too, but you're walking the whole 2,000 miles. You're not going to get a ride in that wagon. You're putting too much strain on the animals if the whole family climbs into the wagon. They were known as inland ships of commerce. They carried up to five tons they were 18 feet long, which is about the length of a modern pickup truck. Okay, 11 feet high, that's really tall, which also caused problems if the wind began to blow because it's 11 feet tall. The ceiling in this classroom is probably 9 or 10 feet, so a Conestoga wagon's top would be another foot above the ceiling in this classroom, and 4 feet wide. So that's pretty narrow, or 4, four feet like this. So... Um, 
kind of interesting. And, and the possibilities on the trail were horrifying. Look at this. From a woman's diary. We passed where they were burying a man. Scarce a day, but someone is left on these plains. On the 72nd day, the same woman wrote, The heart has a thousand misgivings, and the mind is tortured with anxiety. Like, I don't know what's coming next. Anxiety is like a fear that just won't go away. And often I pass the fresh-made graves. I've glanced at the sideboards of the wagons, not knowing how soon it would serve as a coffin for some one of us. So you knew that someone in your party was likely going to die. Here's another journal. Child's grave, smallpox, child's grave. We passed seven new-made graves. One had four bodies in it. Cholera, man died this morning. Cholera, passed six new graves. June 25th, seven graves, made 14 miles. You only go 14 miles in a day. <clears throat> June 26th, eight graves, 10 graves, 10 graves. Oh my gosh, everyone's dying from disease, from exhaustion. Maybe they're too old to make the trip. And, and the maximum that we made, 22 miles on June 30th. That was a really good day. So you're moving at a snail's pace. You don't know if you're ever going to get where you're going. Uh, you're praying that at some point you see some of these landmarks. So when you leave Independence, uh, the, really the first time you see other people besides the people in your wagon train, and it was always smartest to travel with other pioneers, would be Fort Kearney. Fort Kearney is near what is today Kearney. Notice it's spelled different than the city of Kearney, but it's just south of the city of Kearney in Nebraska today. Uh, it, there is a rebuilt fort at Fort Kearney there, and you can like go camping there and stuff. But uh, that was a trading post, so you could stop there and pick up stuff. If you broke a, a, a wagon wheel and you were out of extras, you might pick up an extra wagon wheel at the fort. And, and then as you move on from there, you go a long ways, and, and even today, if you drive along the interstate uh, or the highway from Kearney all the way up here, it's a long, boring drive, and then you all of a sudden hit Chimney Rock and Scott's Bluff, and, and there's some landmarks, and when you hit Chimney Rock, you've made about a third of the trail, and you're like, woo, because you finally know you've been somewhere, so you're going... 14 miles a day and you don't see anything and another four and the kids are like are we there yet I gotta pee and well, I don't suppose that was really an issue because you could just pee wherever but uh, those landmarks were kind of big check this out this is Chimney Rock in 1906 this is Chimney Rock today uh, 36 feet of erosion in that time so Chimney Rock is shorter back then it was this tall now it's only this tall why is it eroding so easily? It's really uh, weak sandstone. So every time it rains, Chimney Rock gets a little shorter. Every time the wind blows, Chimney Rock gets a little shorter. Because it, it sticks up off the plains, strangely like this, every time lightning strikes, it hits Chimney Rock. So it just blows it away. Yeah. <coughs> Show of hands, how many of you have actually been there? Really? Only Shelby? Usually I get like four. It's a little bit out of the way. It's not like on the interstate, so you have to go near Bayard, Nebraska. But uh, there's a highway that runs right here. You go right past it. Uh, there's a visitor center somewhere over here. And they used to, when I was little, I visited Chimney Rock, and they used to just let you climb on it. Like you could go run, and then you'd probably get like here before it got too steep. and you could. But there were people that would climb, you know, and they don't let you anymore. It's fenced off because it erodes. And every time someone climbs on it, it makes it weaker. So uh, to protect the monument and make it last longer, they keep you the heck away from it. But um, there's not much there. But it was exciting. In fact, the trail was maybe 10 or 11 miles away from Chimney Rock. So people would actually leave the trail for a day to go to Chimney Rock just to say that they had been there. And... That was a big deal. It was one of the first landmarks that you see. You actually knew you, um, <clears throat> you might recognize those people. This is near the highway, uh, so we took a little uh, wee a little selfie, the two of us, with Chimney Rock in the background. I, I think we were going to a wrestling tournament. That's usually just two of us. That's usually where we're going. But uh, kind of neat. <clears throat> After Chimney Rock, you hit Scott's Bluff National Monument. Uh, and Scott's Bluff is made of uh, five different rock formations, Saddle Rock, Eagle Rock, Dome Rock, Sentinel, and Crown. And there's two passes. So once you get to Scott's Bluff National Monument, you're like, woohoo! 
But then the problem is you get to Scott's Bluff and you get to these big monoliths, these big rock formations sticking out of the ground, and you look down the other side and you see this. How do you get a wagon and horses or oxen down that hill? There were two ways. It says on this screen there were Mitchell Pass and Coyote. Coyote or Coyote. Some people say Coyote. Where I grew up, it's Coyote. Some people say Coyote. I don't know. You say whatever you want to say. I say Coyote Pass. Uh, so if you want to, on top of this hill, they actually had a pulley rigged up. So you could hook your wagon to this pulley and slowly lower it down this hill. But if the rope breaks on the pulley or the pulley breaks and your wagon goes careening down this hill, everything is destroyed. So you can pay a few dollars to the guy that owns the pulley and get your wagon hopefully lower down the hill, taking a risk. Or you could go to Mitchell Pass, which was a, about a day's travel to the south, Pay a guy a few bucks to go through his pass, which was much easier, and then it takes you another day to get back up to the trail. So how much of a hurry are you in, and how big of a risk do you want to take? That's why there were two passes. So, And Mitchell, at his pass, also had a trading post, so you could go there and buy stuff and, and pick up some extra supplies before you continue to head west. Um, graves all the way along. This is one of my favorite stories. This is the grave of a woman named Rebecca Winter. She was 50 years old, and the, the stone says daughter of a soldier of the American Revolution. <clears throat> the story here, this farmer, uh, decades ago, near Scott's Bluff, was plowing his field, and he hit something. So he went over, and he pulled it out of the ground, and he, it's this hoop. And he's like, what the heck is this? So he investigates a little further, and it has a, an inscription on it. And he figures out that that hoop was a grave marker for this woman, Rebecca Winters. The hoop is actually the outside of a wagon wheel. So uh, since then, people have actually, they fenced it off and put a grave there for her. So the farmer took care of it. Because if someone died there or was buried there, then it's a sacred place. Um, it's part of our culture. So, uh, But she, he looked it up and she had a story. Her father fought in the American Revolution. So that's kind of cool. But... Uh, you can actually stop along the highway and visit this spot. There's lots of places like this that you can stop and visit. Now, this is also a really cool place. If you travel on the highway west from Scotts Bluff, you go another, uh, I don't know, 60, 70 miles, and you run into a little teeny tiny town in Wyoming called Guernsey. They don't even do a very good job of uh, advertising this, but just outside of Guernsey, there's this place called the Oregon Trail Wagon Ruts. This is sandstone. The grooves that you see in the ground are up to five feet deep. They're ruts that were created by the thousands and thousands of wagons that traveled across them. So you can get out of your car and you can run around and you can see it looks like a driveway or a road almost plowed through. Yeah, it's not plowed through. That's just rock. This trail is, the, the land is so sensitive that that trail still exists today as part of the place where the wagons went through. You can see the, the picture in the bottom left, the amount of uh, erosion that those wagon uh, wheels caused in the, the, the soil. This is one of my favorite places along the trail. I've been here a couple of times called Register Cliff. Right along the trail... <clears throat> also near the wagon rut place, <coughs> excuse me, Register Cliff, people would stop here and they would sign up. So it, it's a great big cliff. In fact, what's kind of funny is uh, along the cliff you can see a, a hole. I'm not sure this picture shows us very well. In the 1950s, some farmer owned it. And, and this is soft clay. So it is eroding rapidly also. Every time it rains, it washes some of it away. Someday it won't be a cliff. It'll just be a pile. It's, it's just going away. There's no way to protect it. But some potato farmer dug a big hole in the side of this cliff and stored his potato crop. It's a good idea because it stays nice and cool. But this is what it looks like. So if you, if you walk up to it, people stopped and they took a knife and they sketched their name into this cliff. So people that followed after you could see 
Oh, look, my friend Tex Serpa. He passed by. He's the wagon train master, wagon master in 1889. I knew old Tex. But there's also some negatives to it. Today it's got a big fence in front of it, so you can't actually go up and touch it. But for a long time it didn't, and it wasn't protected. It was privately owned, which just means some farmer owned it. Today it belongs to the uh, either the National Park System or the State Park System in Wyoming. But look here. Old T. Blaylock made it through in 1974. So kids would go up to it and carve their initials or their name into it, thinking they were cool, uh, right next to some guy that came through in 1889. So... That's kind of disappointing. Or here's one, uh, Pam Blair, 1983. Yeah, that's not cool. You're destroying history. It's sort of like uh, some of the nut jobs when you drive across the, the river in toward Iowa and you see people that at some point must have hung over that gigantic tall railroad bridge and spray painted their name on there. And you're like, what kind of a ding-dong climbs clear up there and hangs upside down and spray paints their name? They're going to die. But, yeah. Uh, don't do this. Don't ruin history. But some of it's pretty cool. How about G.O. Willard here from Boston, 1855, 1859. Ar Nesbitt, 1855. So this is people that went through 200 years ago. Uh, this guy, U.S. Post Office, 1857. You might find names up there that you recognize. And, and, and some of them are kind of interesting because they're 12 feet up in the air. And you're like, how did that guy get clear up there? He's maybe standing on someone's shoulders, and you got to be a little careful when you're there because it's also rattlesnake country, and uh, a lot of uh, barn swallows make their nests in the side of this cliff, so rattlesnakes like to climb up there and just wait for swallows to land near them, and then they eat them, uh, so can't get too close because you'll get bitten by a snake, but it, it's really cool to see this, and in two or three generations from now, it'll be erased, not necessarily by vandals, but by weather, erosion will take it away. And then you get to Wyoming and you, and you maybe get to Independence Rock. And it's just a mound of stuff. But every time you see one of those formations, you get excited because it's an indicator that you're further along on the trail. Today, you know, it's like uh, we ask uh, our phones to tell us how to get where we're going. And it says, you're one hour and 57 minutes away. They didn't have that kind of luxury that we do today. You know, heck, our phones, our maps on our phones even tell us where there's road construction or where there's accidents, and it's going to slow us down. So it gives us a really strong indicator of how long it's going to take us to get where we're going. And lots of hardships. About 10% of all settlers died along the way. So if the 25 of us took off on the Oregon Trail, 10% would mean 2.5 of us would die. Which means in some classes, 2 would die, and in some classes, 3 would die, and the average would be 2.5. Which ones? Not me, because I'm tougher than all the rest of you. So that means it's one of you. Yeah, Skeletor. He's too skinny, too scrawny. I don't know what just happened there, because I didn't even press any buttons. So uh, we're going to exit out just for a moment and let our uh, uh, people that are on... Uh, I still don't know what's happening. Here. Our people that are watching this video from their coronavirus couch, uh, we'll let them do their thing. And we will uh, see if we can 